So now without further ado, I'm excited to welcome today Anastasia Rene uh, for her newest collection of poetry, Side Notes from the Archivist. Um, having Anastasia here is just so special for me because I got to get to know, know them in Seattle a few years ago and I got to see her release some three different books, of course the uh, of course, the cross of um, the summer, and it was just so special to see her do that, and it's been fantastic. Um, I also got to see one of the last performances of Nine Ounces, a one-woman show, which is just amazing, and I now can't listen to Nina Simone without thinking about her every single time. Um, and then right before I left, or right after I left Seattle, she had a show for Don't Be Absurd, Alice in Parts at the Seattle Fry Museum. And um, that was very special. Um, and so I'm so excited to bring her down to DC for um, Side Notes from the Archivist, which I've, I've read through front and back just so many times and absolutely love it. Um, Anastasia Rene is a queer writer, educator, interdisciplinary artist, speaker, and podcaster. She is the author of V, Forget It, and Answer Me, and Here in the Middle of Nowhere. Um, they were selected by NBC News as part of the list of queer artists of color dominate 2021's must-see LGBTQ art shows. Anastasia is a former Seattle civic poet, Hugo House poet in residence, ARC artist fellow, and Jack Straw curator. Her work has been anthologized in Teaching Black, Home is Where You Queer Your Heart, Furious Flowers Seeding the Future of African American Poetry, Afrofuturism, among so many others and many more to come. They have received fellowships and residencies from uh, Kaveh Kanem, Hedgebrook, Vona, Ragdale, Mineral School, and more. And currently living in New York. Anastasia is, uh, will be joined in conversation with Danny Terrell, a black trans spectrum queer choreographer, dancer, and movement guide who received Seattle's Mayor Awards Award in 2019. Danny has guided people in Detroit and Seattle, and um, as well as sharing movement practices in other cities in the United States. Currently, Danny is a curator for Central District Forum for Arts and Ideas in Seattle and works at Dance Place here in DC as Dance Place's artistic director. Um, Danny is a host of host and co-creator of several online talk pro programs, including Sunday Dinner, um, The Living Room, and Intimate Conversations. So Anastasia is going to come up and read for a bit, and then Danny's going to join them on stage for a conversation. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Anastasia Renee. Hello, hello. I am so excited to be here. Um, and one of the things that makes me most excited is being a guest of someone who gets me and gets my work. I think it's hard sometimes being a writer, you're, you're not with people as they're reading your work and you're thinking, do they get it? Um, what poems are they reading? How do they feel about it? And it's nice to know that someone is not just skimming through the book, but actually reading, reading it, taking it in and supporting my artistry. So thank you for that. Excited to be here, excited to be in conversation with Danny and share all that with you. Typically, uh, when I'm sharing my work, I don't talk about the poems. I just bulldoze my way straight through. And I thought to myself, all right, hey, you're on book tour. Do you need to change that? And no, I think I'm not going to. Uh, I think I'd rather just bulldoze like I always do. So you'll hear a title and then I'll pause and then you'll hear the poem and then I'll give that poem some breath and then you'll hear a title and then I'll read the poem. And because Danny and I are gonna be in conversation anyway, anything, and you get to ask questions too. So if you are wondering about a particular poem, 
you can just go back and say, oh yeah, I have, I had a question about that and I want to go back to that. So are y'all okay with that? All right, perfect. Um, before I officially start, start, I would like to also give thanks to my ancestors because without my ancestors, uh, maternal and paternal ancestors, I definitely would not be here. And I am just so grateful. Um, and it is actually a miracle that I even get to stand here and read my work in a public space. Um, and so I just wanna give honor to my writing ancestors and my family ancestors that came before me to, to do this work. Um, and I wanna give honor to all the banned books um, when you're a writer, you never write a book thinking that your book could be banned. Um, and I want to encourage folks to read widely. Um, look at those books maybe and maybe ask yourself why, why, why might these books be banned? So it begins, side notes from the archivist. And I think I have done the thing where I left my glasses. My lovely person is going to bring them to me. Thank you, Bay. Beginning with some poems from the first chapter or section, which is Retroflect. Attributes of the archivist takes copious notes, observes, tries to remember, says, remember? Writes to remember, remember? Remembers everything, underlines, stacks, folds, sorts, records, takes pictures, list, 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 holds secrets. Side note, an archive, a collection of documents or records or poems or lists or thoughts, or music, or breaths, or blank spaces providing information about a womb, a place, an institution, memory, ancestors, spirits, community, coven, house, or group of people. Side note, we were trying to create or recreate the architecture of the burgeoning disco scene not because of the disco, but because of the symbolism of the disco ball, of the ball, of gay black men, of trans folks and lesbian women in all sizes, shapes, and types holding them down. Donna Baba and Baba Donna embody a Donna Summer who is doctor, priestess, mother, father, Holy Ghost, and music. Danny Terrell, writer, producer, choreographer, is the fagod. The 80s, I was actually there, had a quadrillion girl bands and boy bands and big group bands, either groups of blood family or chosen family, and they used to color coordinate outfits, do synchronized dance moves, and take airbrushed photos together and slap them on vinyl. This all happened while Donna Summer put out, she works hard for the money, and at 13, I didn't fully know who the she's she was referring to were. Even when I wanted, even then I wanted to be Donna Baba, maybe in a big group and luscious lips and flipped hair, but wearing a tuxedo and bow tie. In Philadelphia that same year, I had to walk five to six blocks to the bus stop and it seemed like all the people I encountered on my walk were getting thinner and thinner until one block was absent of all adult morning activity. Only small children were running the streets and parenting smaller children to get ready for school. By April, there were people walking around with pipes and strange items that looked like cotton and cigarettes all over the street. There were people holding boom boxes, blaring girl bands and boy bands and Donna Summer. The news talking about some kind of gay plague once, a tall woman approached me and told me to tell them, keep it in your pants unless you can make me dance. She laughed with her mouth wide open, and I thought her three teeth were white and beautiful. And my 13-year-old nose loved the way she smelled, similar to red jello and granddaddy's aftershave. 
That same year, I watched my schoolmate's mother walk him to the bus stop every morning in a long brown hijab with lunch in hand, smelling like cocoa butter. And she would kiss him on the cheek and tell all of us, my salama, and we would all feel so acknowledged. I look forward to this ritual. We all noticed it had been weeks since she since we'd seen him or his mother on a Friday Juma. He was finally at the bus stop and we who barely even talked to him asked where he'd been and one of us yelled, and where's your mom? I missed her too. And he said with a face as blank as a dry erase board, she died of AIDS last week and I'm not gonna lie about it. If you don't wanna touch me or talk to me, then don't. And I watched my bus stop friends scatter and move away from him. I stayed where I was standing and said, I was really sorry and thought to myself, if only Donna Baba had appeared, like Shazam, like Pow, like Alhamdulillah. Nineteen eighty-two. You wore your favorite hijab so tight and brushed the baby hairs in a straight line first before they called them edges and comb your forehead baby hair with a fluoride infused toothbrush from the free lunch school packet then crossed them at all the ends religiously and that's when you realize there are so many boundaries no one can see or touch Nineteen eighty-four, two. You are a hairy-legged girl wondering about shaving her legs, who notices when men talk, Tina Turner always gets reduced, and there is magic in black knees, black calves, black thighs, and a black woman saying, you better be good to me. But men who talk about Tina's legs never grunt about Ike in all the times she paid for the big wheels she kept turning. 1985, one. You have seen the helicopter swarming over the forbidden house of Africa, and you know you are never able to tell this tale or finish this poem. It is a poem about Philadelphia. No, it is a poem about the house of Africa. No, it is a poem about helicopters. No, it is a poem about bombs. Last week, now, you saw a helicopter swarming while you were sipping your coffee and the Lululemon ladies sunglass down in unison to watch the propellers moving. And you almost choked on your own memories of the helicopter dropping bombs over Africa, burnt hair in the middle of your Philly street. Side note. As the smoke rose from 6221 Osage Avenue, Philadelphia, residents watched through their windows or television screens in a state of stunned disbelief. Their city had just bombed its own people. 1985-2. When Bo and Hope had simulated almost teen sex on Days of Our Lives to Peebo Bryson's If Ever I'm In Your Arms Again, at 13, you wanted that, and you wanted to be the leather jacket wearing bow, holding hope and awestruck, and you wanted to be hope, so true, so ready, bursting 80s pop and summer explosion. And when you heard girls should never have or be hopeful about boys, that sex was a thing you did to make miniature adults, you knew these days were not about your life, and Peebo Bryson wasn't making songs for girls like you. Section two, retro fuckery. List. One, my body is a forest. Two, the rainforest is burning. Three, I am burning, first my heart and then my eyes. Each one smells of fish oil and champagne to celebrate, mark, Ping, thumbs up. Four, my body is an ocean. Five, the ocean is covered with microplastics. Six, I am wading through faux and replica. Is this live or memorex? Is my piss in 3D? Is my uterus compostable? And who the took my pearls? Seven, dead babies. Eight, I had one. Nine, I shook in the shower and I shook in the kitchen and I shook at the doctors and I shook on the sidewalk and I shook 
a stranger's hand. It was moving. There was an aftershock, a casual conversation. 10, there have been earthquakes and earthquakes and earthquakes. Side note, girls grow up. Her life, the black girl in unedited episodes. Pilot episode. In this episode, the black girl contemplates, am I a cannibal? Am I a cannibal? Am I? All the way she boils her rot and gums, her bliss away, how no two fingernails taste alike, and eating crow holds the same texture as a lung. The black girl's current catchphrase, everything gives her life because most days she wants to live. And how can the black girl live when she is the butcher of her own skin? From the writers and directors. Ah, we might keep some of the original takes of her and air them as YouTube videos. I mean, she could easily become the next YouTube it girl. For now, we're just gonna be reviewing some of the episodes and trying to figure out what parts of the black woman to throw away and what part of the black woman to keep. Episode 24. At the black girl's job, she overheard coworker A tell coworker B that she heard kale is the new vegetable. And black girl thought to herself, there ain't nothing new about kale or collards or mustards or soil underneath a black girl's fingernails. At the black girl's second job, she overheard coworker A tell coworker B how excited she was to go on a camping trip to connect with nature and the tent and the living on the land and the stars and the moon and the water and the quiet and the safety of Mother Earth. Later on in this episode, the black girl walks a country mile in her food desert just to get a bunch of fresh greens. The black girl wonders how it is that she has become Mother Earth's stepchild. How it is she has to pay for the moonlight and water. How it is she fell like a shooting star. How she cannot see her bright in her mother and she focuses on the boundless sky. Ah, when we're done, we'll change it up. We'll cast a different woman with a soul. We originally wanted a black girl to sing Erica Badu's My Life, My Life. Then we could use and make it look like a soulful white girl was singing it. I mean, my life. We are still in conversations about that. And of course, we will be completely transparent with the black girl before we air the shows. Episode 27, the most popular in this episode, the black girl receives a letter in the mail informing her that her body, having been slowly, historically erased anyway, will be a gentrified landmark. She has been asked to give her consent to this. She is supposed to say, take my body as a living sacrifice. Yeah, we plan to add maybe some gospel music and then make the black girl kind of look like she sort of wants to be gentrified. And then we might have to do something with the white girl who'll see her value, but not see her value. We might add one of her co-workers to save her life at this point and gentrify her later. We also might throw in a lump in her breast, something physical to keep audience members coming back to the next episode. Episode zero. In this episode of The Black Girl, which will not air, where the black girl conjures up her dead baby and the dead baby conjures up the dead womb and the dead womb conjures up its womb's lineage and the lineage tells the girl her baby has joined the sea, that dead black babies all start out as black girls and all black girls are black babies start out as God floating. Yeah, we just find this too far-fetched. Even if fantasy or sci-fi, we can't sell this. The black woman as an altar. One, lay your white flowers on her altar. Let them be thorny and thick and full of insects to honor her life. One A, let them, the flowers, be fragrantly, overwhelmingly to represent. 
the way she blooms across a hardwood floor and cannot be contained even inside a flared nostril. Two, place or put or pour a glass of room temperature water because the black woman is always seeking balance, ain't she? A woman always told she's too hot or too cold has to be excellent and never in between. 2A, make the room temperature water all dreadlocked Goldilocks and just right. If the water spills, let it run down the length of the altar as a sign of continuous flow. Three, write a letter to womb. Call it magical. Call it home. Call it hers. Call it God. But hide this letter in case the government decides to step in. Three A, draw a sketch of stretch marks and label each one a new constellation. Make her navel a moon inside a moon inside a moon and call that moon alpha. Four, if she died by a mob or a man or murder, pray she will be merciful that no one will be the weight of her own omega. Y'all doing okay? Okay. Couple more and then let's get into it. Black hole. When the scientists say the black hole that shouldn't even be a black hole exists and is larger than any black hole, I hear cool dirt being shoveled in my ears. It sounds like plastic in the ocean. Two. I have always loved the color black, not because it's beautiful, but because it's mysterious, or not because it's mysterious, but because it's overpowering, or because it's big, or I love the color black because it is not in the rainbow, and I am always rooting for the hue no one sees. Three, once I imagined my womb as a black hole, and a daughter I had got sucked in and lost forever, and another daughter I didn't know got sucked out, and if my black womb is a black hole, then the black hole could be a womb. And that makes sense when the scientists say that the black hole that shouldn't even be a black hole exists, and is larger than any black hole because, I mean, history. Four, what if there are women Mismatched socks, lost little girls, gunshot victims, keys, reproductive rights, earring backs, memories, and chapstick in a black hole. Five, another reason I like the color black is because in the 70s, people gave five on the black hand side, and I miss doing this. And the missing gives me a black hole as if it never existed, as if it shouldn't really exist, not because I am beautiful, but because my hue is invisibly overpowering. I mean, history. Crest, here your body has poured a chalice so full your nerves runneth over, and your eyes vibrate bronze and crack pewter. Say to each molecule rocking back and forth, rest to every artery and chambered conch to the blood cresting and vessels mouthing, the tide is out. To each sense sanitized with woe, to tiny specks of deliverance in each eye, in the sunflowered centers of every fibroid or jellied cyst, and the Alice Coltrane of every tumor's melody. Rest here. One more, and we'll let the book choose what that's going to be. What say you, Side Notes? Side Notes is a, is a Pisces. I just want you to know that. Um, with the Sagittarius and a Scorpio moon, I believe. So you could only imagine the journey of Side Notes. Usher in white. I am the usher of night women, day omens, the circadian rhythm mashups and gyrate of open-eyed 
prophecy women, the fire under the tongue and next time women, the Giovanni's room pepper sauce tears women, the trap crackle pop vinyl women, the freaks come out at night women, the my pronouns are they, them, and unicorn women, the southern spit on top of Midwest drool by way of soup jumu women, the barbecue and jazz crazy little women, women, the forgive but don't forget, heal you with herbs from my garden, women, the don't ask my neighbor but you better ask somebody, women, salt across the threshold plus garlic at the door, women, I had an abortion on my birthday, women, grudge holding as you cover me with dirt, women, black candle and release cleanse on a new moon and burn you with sage, women, thank you. Hello. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hello. Y'all, yeah. I know we're sitting with the vibration of Anastasia Renee, and we're just in our feelings. But I said, hey. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. I'm from Detroit, so we do this. We talk back to people, and we give folks energy even after this. Part of that energy is to help continue the vibration in the room. All right? OK, I need y'all to be active and not passive, is what I'm trying to say. I need y'all to be active. Thank you. We cannot have somebody pour their hearts out, and y'all sit there like, oh, we can see y'all. Y'all, nobody's hiding. Like, I can literally see every last one of y'all. You ready? I need to I give her a ready. minute also. I, yes. Yeah, I need it a minute. <laughs> breathe. Okay. Breathe, 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 everybody, breathe. Um, <laughs> that is a surprise. <laughs> a good surprise. <laughs> wow. Um, hello. Hi. This is a good surprise. <laughs> good. Thank you for that. See? That's how you enter a room. Make yourself known. Um, I probably, you know I'm going. I know you. You know what I'm going to do. So, yeah. I'm just going to start off with something that you're going to read. Um, how is your body doing? Um, Good. I don't read these poems a lot. They're written poems, and i it's new sharing them verbally. So I don't really know how they move through my body yet until I keep doing it, if that makes sense. This is, some of these poems I would never, ever read out loud, like ever. So. Why did you decide to put them in a book? Because I wanted them read. <laughs> but wanted, not out loud. I wanted other people <laughs> to read the poems is mainly why I put them in the book. I knew that I would have to read them right. for these purposes, but truly, I just, I'm still getting used to reading them. There are poems in here, stories, archives in here that I, we talked about this was a, a surprise to me and many people that know you. Um, why at this point in time in your life did you make a choice to share these or did you make that choice? Because I know that things move around you, that they make that choice for you. Mm. I definitely think um, I have been sitting on the Philadelphia poems for a long, long time. And I needed to make sure that I was ready to put them out there. Um, and they're very close to me. And I just don't think I was, I was ready yet. Um, 
And then I realized when I was ready to do those, like this whole book isn't that. It's not, the whole book isn't the Philly poems. And I don't know, something in that made it easier. And when I realized that, I realized, oh, this isn't, this isn't a book of poems, this is a project. I was, I was talking about this um, at an, another time, and that's like, books for me are projects. There's usually a through line, there's usually, there's a theme happening. It's not just a collection of poems curated for me. It is, a, it's a big project. And I think after I put out V and Forget It, um, I thought, okay, you you went there. You were kind of brave. You were doing a lot of like socio political work in V, and you did some some memoir work and forget it. You asked Alice to help you, you know, fictional character Alice to help you write, forget it. And I thought, like, okay, I, I guess I'm, I guess I'm ready for side notes. But it is not a book that happened overnight. It is a it is a book that happened that was archived over over time and then I went back and added maybe more up to date things. I find it interesting that it, it that it's coming out in this time and then looking at specific art during this time and I think people are in a space of prayer and meditation. So I think people are not creating art. They're creating prayers and meditations to not just heal from what everyone, when the world shut down, but to heal and to move through what has happened before that. And so even reading this, I'm like, oh, it's prayer and meditation. So I think people are moving beyond this idea of what we think art is and the way that we manifest our prayer and meditation is through these creative practices. Mm. I would agree. I think a lot of the side notes are lists, which for me could be prayers, could be meditations. Um, and I, I do agree with you. Um, my person, Naakua, pulled some cards about the book, and one of the one of the cards literally said, "Like your book, this book is an altar." And at first I scoffed, I was like, okay. But then I thought about it like, yeah, it is. It's a collection of sacred things, things that are sacred to me in one space where I keep adding things. It is, it is an altar. So for me, I think there is some prayer. There's some prayer, there's some meditation, there's some just outright anger. Um, there's some sadness, there's some joy. Mm -hmm. I think of, of, of all of that in this book. The thing that, that also struck me in the first few um, pages, HIV and AIDS, of course, was a work that we deeply moved through. And then the bombing was another work mm. that moved through the world that a lot of us are just finding out about. And they line up with each other in a weird particular way of like time frame in your life that you were living through. Can you talk about those things separately and together? Yes, I think I can. <laughs> or can <laughs> you try used... to? I will try. <laughs> um, so at the time of the move bombing, I was not this very aware, aware mature adult who had seen a lot in her life. I was 12 or 13 years old. I was a preteen. Um, and this huge event happened in my life. I literally watched a helicopter bomb a house, you know, as a young archivist. I could smell the burning hair. I, I don't I don't think I could have ever written it as a straight up memoir. Mm -hmm. I want to say that. And so writing it in a poetry form has helped me as the archivist excavate that. Mm -hmm. So I just remember being younger thinking like this is even I think this is unbelievable. Like this is I cannot believe this is happening. But you know when you're young everything is happening to you. 
So it was like, I can't believe this is happening to me. Like, I can't believe I'm viewing this. I can't believe this is real. I can't believe. Um, and then fast forwarding as an adult, I look back and think like, wow. I was around, not just around, but I was there. Mm -hmm. Does that still resonate in your body? Yes, it does. So I think about the move bomb and all that happened and, um, you know, I was t just talking to my mom and she, you know, I finally, I hadn't really talked to her. I asked her, you know, like, what, how are you feeling about that time? And I, I wasn't a mother, but as a mother now, I understand sometimes we just keep it pushing. We're trying to protect our children. And from my point of view, she wasn't really moved about move. Like, we're just doing our regular stuff. And she finally told me a couple of weeks ago, like, yo, I was horrified. I was trying to keep life normal. I was afraid if we went outside in, in our hijab and as Muslims on the street, we might be next. And so I tried to keep it as normal as I could for you. I did not know that. So I think I'm... I'm finding out things that I didn't realize because now I can be the adult, the archivist. The archivist has grown up. The archivist can look back and say, oh, when this happened, it's because of X, Y, Z. So there was the, the bomb and also the, the, the bomb of just being a preteen. <laughs> That's a bomb. Um, and then this, the, the area that I was in and the other experiences I was going through, all of that was a bomb resonating. And I think... That's another reason why it took a bit to, to try and write work that talked about the incidents without making them the showcase, not the centerpiece. I don't want someone to read the book and only think about the move poem, but I do want someone to read the book and say, I never heard a move. What, 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 what is that if they, don't, if they don't know? But I didn't want it to be I didn't want that to bomb the book, but I wanted to talk about the impact of the bomb from the young archivist's point of view. And what about, at that point in time, HIV and AIDS? That was another bomb, really, that dropped in our country in the late 70s, early 80s. Yeah, I happen to be... And I'm not the only one. I happened to grow up in a time of several bombs. There was the actual move bomb, and then the bomb, the bomb of crack, and then the bomb of um, gangs, Bloods versus Crips, and then the bomb or bomb, B-A-L-M, of hip hop. There were a lot of bombs and bombs happening. Um, and I, I, I think I just really wanted to show pieces of those inside notes. There was, there's no way to talk about it all for me in one book, but I, I wanted to show pieces of those things happening, all converging in one space and all converging in one body, the archivist body, and all converging in one, one pair of eyes, sort of taking it all in and trying to process it. It's interesting that you say pieces and you write with such clarity that it wasn't really the piece it was the whole picture and so i i i didn't need a full book to understand the impact of that moment you have seen the helicopter swarming over the forbidden house of africa like that's clear <laughs> You know, <laughs> there's just always that piece of me that is, it's only, it still feels like a side note. You know what I mean? Which is good. It's good, right? Yeah. But it, uh, it, it, it doesn't fully express. But when, but that's the thing, you know, with being a writer, you're not there. I'm not there with the people who are reading. Somebody might say, does she literally mean Africa, right? To see, that's something I have to grapple with, and that's why I'm, I'm hoping. Yes, that's what you mean. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm speaking for you. I shouldn't, but. You know what I mean, though. Like, <laughs> like yes. <laughs> not like 
if they don't know anything about move it i have to think about well how does it how does it look if they if they if they read it into it that way maybe that's okay i think that that this whole idea of like a big picture in a piece i've tried to write about the pieces but i wanted to write them in big ways you're 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 writing about something that has taken place for centuries, especially in this country. I say centuries, years. It feels like centuries <laughs> in this country. Yes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm you like, do. maybe I did make a mistake when I said <laughs> that. Um, but it's, it, it has happened. It will continue to happen, especially to black neighborhoods. And now we call it gentrification because to outright kill people in that way, people are too aware now. Yeah. And so when we look back at Rosewood, we look back at uh, Detroit Black Bottom, we look back at the Bronx, we look back at all of these places that it's like, oh, y'all there, that's great. Here's a highway, oops, we don't know how that happens. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They weren't taken care of they were violent they were this and it's continuously happening yeah we've only been in dc me and my partner for what 18 months or so and we see it in front of our face consistently and it's like oh you just ain't gonna hide it like you did a better job at hiding it before and when you write about it it just brings back all of that history 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 so that's what the clarity is for me is that you understand it in such a deep level and if you're reading this you know it's not just philly you know that africa means even the united even states the, yeah. <laughs> and africa that's the thing africa, yes. you know yeah. what i mean like yes that that is what i was or i am i'd say it's new i am going for in the book I also think about what you said because of this gentrification and the like here today, gone tomorrow or bombings, or you can't afford your rent. We're going to make a cute cafe now. Um, the, I think it's really, I think it's really important to archive, right? Yeah. To take copious notes, to take pictures, to, to, to like get quotes to like, what was this thing we were talking about? What were we saying? What were we doing? S take a picture of this text. What kind of food are we eating? I, I, I've always been wanting to archive, I guess, for fear that it's going to go away. If it's going to go away, let's at least have concrete, factual memories of it. Let's have the proof. Let's have the proof that we existed. You know, we are the biggest erasure poem that could ever be. And I think archiving for me says, no, you, you know, like we were here. We are, you know, we are here. We're gonna open it up to the audience in a minute. We we can't get to everything I want to talk about, but All right. there's there's a lot. The thing that I want to sit with in this episode, the black girl receives a letter in the mail informing her that her body, having been slowly historically erased anyway, will be a gentrified landmark. I continue ugh, continue to think about um, there are even black girls that, that their bodies are no longer landmarks because we forget about them. Yeah. And the way that you, I'm going to use this, this phrase and not that I mean it in this way, but the way you, you give honor to black women's, black girls, black films, bodies in this way so we can remember consistently i can remember even as a trans spectrum person i don't present as but i remember that black girls bodies are landmarks living landmarks that should be valued consistently but in this it is clearly stated that we don't yeah, I and I, these are some of the things that keep me awake at night <laughs> because I don't want anyone to walk away thinking like, wow, Anastasia is really a Debbie Downer. Like, she just doesn't, of course we value ourselves. And it's like, 
Some of us don't. You're so archiving the truth. I'm I'm trying to archive a truth. You um, are. I am archiving. This is my friend, so I can talk to <laughs> them this way. You know. I am, okay. I am archiving a truth, and I do feel like as the young archivist, there were times when I didn't feel my body, my space, my mind was a landmark. And so I'm, I'm also writing from an archivist's point of view too. When I look around, I don't necessarily see the value still. And at that time, when I was a younger person, there was a lot less to look at. I couldn't just go on the internet and do a Google search of like, black women on the covers of magazines. It was whatever was in Kansas City. It was whatever was in Philadelphia. It was Cosmopolitan. It was Vogue. It was 17. There wasn't a big representation of what I saw in my home or from my family or bits and pieces. Um, and so I was coming from that place. Like it just keeps getting erased or you don't even get to learn about it. Or you don't even know about it. You don't even know the greatness exists. It's a, it's like there's this beautiful sunset behind you and no one, no one told you, you don't even know about it. You have the glow. No one told you that you deserve to even witness it. Exactly. Yeah. So that's what I was going for, what I'm going for in that poem about not knowing. I think the important job that you have in archiving is that you have to, and you're allowing us to remember the pain and the joy and the beauty and the fear of the past so we don't forget where we came from. Because as we all know in this room, we're going back there real quick. <laughs> we're going back there real quick. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is not a Debbie Downer. It is a reminder that like, okay, we can go, hey, party over here. <laughs> but then we turn it around and like, okay, okay, the knife missed me that time in my back. Okay, let me dip again. Okay, yeah. let me dip again. Because they're literally killing people and we still are pretending that they're not. We are still killing people and we yeah. are pretending that we're not. So it's not just that they, we are all taking responsibility. And I think this is allowing us to take responsibility, your work. Thank you. Love you. <laughs> what y'all got to say? <laughs> y'all have questions? I'm like, Y'all got questions? Please take me off today's hot seat. Mercy. I can't say so, I just wanna say thank you. Yes. Um, Something that uh, came out about uh, archiving and as a person being recorded and rising and lost and back and forth, stories not told. One of my favorite sayings is the map is not the territory, but you just gave me a gift. We are the territory. So thank you. I just want to thank you for that. Sir, are you thank a you. Barack Obama? Like literally, sound and look. <laughs> no, really. I was like, wait a minute. Are you fooling us? You just sneak it in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> See, I wasn't the only one thinking it. Mm -hmm. See. <laughs> I am so sorry that I was late. Um, hi. I, so first of all, thank you for this work so much. Um, I think for me, it locked, unlocked something in me that is about the capacity for black girlhood as a particular, as like an ontological position that is able to kind of mark time and view the world for what it is. And I think for me, reading this unlocked for me what it meant to be like a black girl in LA in, in the early 90s, right? in the bombs of that moment and to be and to be able to note kind of to be able to speak a truth and understand a truth about the world by being a black girl at that time right and so much of that comes through particularly these poems that are not only dealing about with kind of what it means to be in that body but also that body in a place. So I guess I have kind of two questions, like what has that meant for you growing into the older archivist and still being quite transient, 
moving from different city and continually making notes, I'm sure, right? And then also, where do you lay that archive down? I was just speaking to someone about, you know, the idea of having an archive, you know, and thinking about like, oh, where would I put my papers? Mm -hmm. Where would you lay it down? Oh, first of all, I love you. Um, love you more. <laughs> oh, I'm a horrible liar. Um, this move from Seattle to New York actually did, it did bring up a lot that resonated with the book. I didn't know that it would be, that, that it would, but like I've seen, I mean, it's East Coast and the book takes place in the East Coast. I never thought mm. that of the parallels and so I have had times in where I'm like I'm trans I'm what was I thinking uprooting my life moving to a new place like it it brought up some of that the transient the moving around a lot the like where is my home what is home is home inside is home outside is anybody else going through this feeling like I don't know where to I, all I can say is that there were parallels that I didn't know that were that would happen between the book coming out and 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 moving. And the second part of that, where would I lay my papers down? Mm. I would have to say I give my papers to my children. Um, and there, I want to be a legacy to the to the youngers. I I don't know. I have this corny vision that in the way that I put, pick up Audre Lorde's books that like some years from now, someone will look at my papers and pictures and quotes and corny thoughts in the book and be like, oh, like I get it. Or also this resonates with me now. So I guess I leave my papers to the youngers and the younger youngers the two-year-olds now, the the ones who have no, no, they're still pretty innocent. They don't really know everything that's going on. I want, I want them to be able to, to, to grab side notes and say, ooh, there's, there's bombs happening right now, but I'm here. Let me start writing down my archive. Let me take some pictures. Let me take copious notes. Let me make some recipes. Let me get in some healing circles and record what happens. So... Yeah, thank you for that question. I've been toying with the idea of legacy because I always thrust it on other people, and I never fully say that I would. I, I am aiming to be in the legacy crew as well. Hi. Thank Hi. You. Hello. Um, I'm Jessica. I'm super glad to be here, and um, it didn't feel like a Debbie Downer to me at all. Just FYI, um, it just felt like the truth. And so I would love for you to talk a little bit, if you don't mind, about truth telling. And uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, that's all right. And also, um, um, this juxtaposition that you did between going camping and the food desert situation, I think I was going to like leave an imprint in my brain forever. And I think there's a lot of that that you do. Just It's like mirroring, right? Reality. Um, and that's so important, particularly realities that people ignore or don't see or, you know, whatever's happening. So the last thing I would say is that there's, um, you, you call yourself an archivist, which makes a lot of sense to me, but I also think of you as a weaver in terms of, in terms of the words. Okay. <laughs> I Thank you. Yeah. I'm trying to, I want to go back to your original question, which was about truth telling. Mm -hmm. um, I think as someone who is a writer of poetry and fiction, mm -hmm. that I am not always going for the truth, but I am going for a truth. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say I am speaking on behalf of everybody, everybody, anybody who looks like me, talks like me, breathes like me. Um, but I do want to talk about some truths. And I think I can do that better when it's fiction 
or poetry because I have more creative room to tell a truth and nobody can say, hey, that's not a, I don't know about that truth. And I can say, this is poetry. You can, I don't care if you, if you agree with it or not. It is a truth. However, when writing, if I'm writing about myself, truth telling takes on a whole new meaning because I want to provide the receipts. The archivist provides the receipts. The truth teller, the poet writes it. The archivist says, here's when it happened. Here's the receipt to prove it. Here's where you can go find the information. So I think for me, this idea of truth telling gets really stressful when it, when it, when it re veers on the side of nonfiction because I want it to be accurate. But when I'm writing truths in fiction or poetry, I'm, I, feel, I feel freer. Mm -hmm. But in side notes, there was both of that happening. Mm -hmm. and needed the archivist to step in and say, hey, you think this poem is a cute poem about bombs and helicopters, but no, I need to provide the receipts for this. So that's just how I feel about, about truth telling. I also think, lastly, that our truths change. Some things are the truth. No matter what happens, some things change over the years. A truth you might have had at 11 or 13 it may not be the truth that you have at 50 or 60 or 70. And so I, 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 am, I am always thinking about the truths that can change more shift and then which ones are just like hardcore, there's no, this is an unwavering, this is an unwavering truth. Thank you. We are going to wrap up here. It is that time. Um, let's see, Alan, slow. Yes, yeah. it's like slowly creeping. You're slowly. Up. Right. <laughs> well, I, I want to say that um, I have a two-year-old yes. that I am definitely passing your papers on to. Mm. I, I have a lot of your papers. Mm. And I've always appreciated what you write and what you talk about and how you do it. So thank you so much. Um, Danny, thank you. This conversation was beautiful. It's exactly what we needed tonight. Thank you. So um, we're gonna um, we're gonna wrap up. Can we give can we give Anastasia a round of applause? I got one more question. Mm -hmm. I always end with a question. Yes, do it. Always end with, with a question of the year and it's a question I always ask for the year. And this year, the question is, thank you, uh, Viola Davis, for this is not mine. What are you living for? Background on the question. Oprah Winfrey interviewed Viola Davis. Look at it on uh, next, next Netflix. I can't say it, Netflix. Uh, great interview, and Viola Davis always asks when she takes on a character, what is the character living for? And that really was an important question to me in this point in time in my life, and I was just like, what are you living for? And I get lost in that sometimes because I forget the actual purpose. So I was like, oh, that's the question of the year. So I asked that after I re after rehearsals, when I dance, performances that, like, so that is the question. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, right on time. <laughs> I am living to stay alive. Mm. Like to to be here in all levels. I'm, I'm living to to stay here and thrive and be alive. That is what I'm. That's. We ask questions, even now we leave it like that. All We're right. going to leave it just like that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you, Politics and Pros. Thank you, Thank Alan. You. Uh, Thank y'all for being yes. here. Please take a moment with Anastasia. Thank you. <laughs>